Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. It's my first solo talk, so for the past two days I've been, I've been listening to wonderful people and fretting about when it would be my turn. But here we are, and I'm really very pleased to be able to preach, probably to the converted, because if you're here, it means you're already quite passionate about design, but preaching to the converted and the non-converted about the importance of design in today's society and also in policy making and in, of course, technological progress. I have worked at MoMA for the past 17 years, coming from Italy, where I studied as an architect. And in Italy, architecture, design, fashion, pizza making, they all go into the same big pot. It's all about doing something creative that is then uh, aimed towards a goal that is also usable by many people. Now, of course, if you take such a wide definition of design, that goes far beyond cute chairs and fast cars. And that's the real interesting situation that I found myself in when I came to the United States. The United States has an amazing design tradition, not to mention Aspen. I don't know how many of you know about the International Design Conference in Aspen. Quite a few, but for those who don't, in 1951, Walter Papke, who was the uh, CEO, I think that was the title, but anyway, the owner of, of Container Corporation in Chicago, teamed up with Herbert Bayer out of the Bauhaus in Germany, and they organized the first international design conference in Aspen, whose aim was to put together industrialists and designers in the belief, belief that we discuss so much even today, that design would be an extremely important force, not only for business, but also for the output, for production, for products, for the consumers, for the betterment of society. And this conference went on for many, many, many years, and it had the help on the board of, say, Charles and Ray Eames, George Nelson, Saul Bass, uh, you know, Milton Glaser, you know, Jane Thompson, you name it, some of the most important important designers in the United States, and it forged relationships that you're sitting on even today probably. Well, not here, but if you're at the Meadows, you are sitting and sleeping in, in, in the products of those relationships, the great icons of American design. So with this kind of tradition in Aspen and the United States, I'm always so amazed to see that design doesn't really have a proper position in people's culture. For instance, let's take New York. New York and the New York Times, the New Yorker, all the so-called main publications. They don't have a design critic. They have critics for theater, two or, four, two or three. They have movies, art, probably six. And they even have a perfume critic, but they don't have a design critic. So how many people are touched by dance and how many people are touched by design? Dance is very important. I never mean to demean other disciplines. I mean to exalt and elevate design. So with this kind of uh, militant uh, uh, militant attitude that came out of surprise in a way, I began at MoMA trying to uh, explain to the audience that would be coming to the museum the importance of design. The funny thing is that it's not difficult. The moment people find themselves in a museum with that kind of distance that is created by the act of going to the temple and see an object that they are so used to in that context, all of a sudden there's a moment of revelation. They understand why it's so important. And out of this kind of comfort and ease with the people that the audiences have with design, I created a series of exhibitions that were about really highlighting different aspects of design. And I'm not going to talk to you about too many of them because I want to get to talk to me. But just to give you an example, the first show that I organized was in 1995, that's a long time ago, and it was called Mutant Materials in Contemporary Design. That was a strange moment in engineering and in design where so many of the tools of production of raw materials, because of the advancement of technology of production, could be actually in the hands of designers. Let me give you an example. Plastic chairs, right? Until about 25, 30 years ago, if you wanted to do a plastic chair, you could do the model in gypsum or in other materials, but then if you wanted to produce it, you had to make an investment of at least $50,000 to create a mold that would be made out of steel and aluminum, whereby the pellets of plastic would be injected in high pressure and high temperature, blah, 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 blah. You had to actually go to a company, invest the money, and do it. Today, and even in 95, because of the advancement, especially in the technology of resins, designers could do it in their own office, could put the catalyst together with the main resin and let it harden at ambient temperature. That freed up an enormous amount of design possibilities, and this show was all about that. It was about showing to people objects made with new innovative materials or objects made with old materials treated in an innovative way. 
And it was quite exciting. I mean, what you see in the slide to the far left were the aerogels. That was kind of a funny story. You know, I had just come to the United States, so I didn't know anything or very little about American history. So I found out that the government of the United States has these technology transfer centers. There's five of them. What they do is they take technology that was developed by the military and they make it available for civilian use. So I got this tall ream of patents from these technology centers and I started leafing through them and I saw this something called aerogels coming from the Lawrence Livermore Department uh, lab. I didn't know what the Lawrence Livermore lab was, but these were so beautiful, these objects, these materials. So I put them in the show, and they attracted everybody's attention. The New York Times critic Herbert Mouchamp, whom I adored, he's now dead, unfortunately, always to, taking leaps of poetry, said that they were lighter than air, which, of course, it's not true, because otherwise they would float, but it didn't matter. But the funny thing is that at the opening... This lady came, and she was like this beautiful, tall lady, blonde. She had nail polish, you know, and she said... She was the PR from Lawrence Livermore, and she said, Oh, Paola, I cannot tell you what a pleasure it is to see our work in a peaceful setting. And I was like, what? <laughs> so I did a little research, and I don't know what the aerogels were initially developed for, but certainly it was interesting. But the exhibition was really um, uh, a catalyst for many people, for many people in the audience, but also for designers, which is one of the important features of many of the shows that we make at MoMA. We talk to an audience of uh, our public, which is three million people a year, but we also talk to artists and to designers. And one of our roles is truly to also contribute to the advancement of the disciplines that we, that we celebrate all the time. You know, MoMA was founded in 1929, and design was, since the beginning, part of the mission of the museum. Uh, the founding director, who was in his late 20s at the time of the founding of the museum, Alfred Barr, had just come back from a grand tour of Europe where he had visited the Bauhaus. So his idea was that the unity of the arts, painting, sculpture, drawings, prints, coming together with architecture, design, film, and photography, would be really the key to an understanding of the future of culture. So that's why the tradition is so strong. This second exhibition that I'm just introducing to you is called Work Spheres, and it was in 2001. In 2001, it actually started in 2000, it was just the, um, in the middle of the dot-com boom and just before the dot-com bust. And it was also the beginning of wireless technology. You know, there was so much promise, but nothing worked. We were always traveling with a lot of cables, and then the cable would be wrong. We would be dialing into the server, and it was off, it was down. So... Everybody was really uh, hoping and also being very frustrated. And also people were changing their ways to, uh, the ways in which they were working, really their environment. All of these new startup companies had a different way to arrange the space for creativity. So they were, instead of having cubicles and instead of having separation, there would be many more spaces for gathering. And so we commissioned six teams of designers to work on six different issues. You know, we identified the issues and then picked the designers. And you will ask me, why six? Because we had money for six. I mean, sometimes these kind of mysterious choices come from budget reasonings. But so what you're looking at here was the problem of uh, how do you deal with a cubicle? Say you are given a cubicle and there's nothing else you can do. Uh, we gave it to a Japanese designer, of course, because you know, we knew that he would uh, know how to deal with very confined spaces. Actually, Naoto Fukasawa, who at that time was still working with IDEO, the company that is so well represented here at the Aspen Ideas Festival. And he came up with this beautiful idea. It was the beginning of OLED screen technology. OLED screens are basically uh, a squished LED screen. So it's, it's, a, it's a continuous surface that gives you the same definition as, as LED but costs much less. Well, they told us it costs much less. It still costs too much, but we'll get there at some point. And what he decided to prepare were these personal skies. So so they are like carpets floating on top of your cubicle where you can project a sky that a friend of yours has sent you, let's say a sunset from Maui or uh, a dawn in Vienna, and therefore have your hole in the sky even though you're in a cubicle. So it's quite beautiful and poetic, and it's uh, an example of how designers respond to new challenges in, in society. And this brings me back to another important feature of MoMA. What I would like to do today is also to connect what I do with the tradition of MoMA, because it's really a continuation of ideas. MoMA has always addressed 
issues in society. To give you an example, there was a, a whole program that started in the 1930s that was called Good Design Under $5, Under 10. And then in the time of war, it was called Good Design in Times of War. You know, so no aluminum, no steel. How do you deal with uh, domestic life with good design without nettles? So there's always a, a need to address what is going on in society at large. And this show that is called Safe, Design Takes on Risk, was another example. It happened in 2005, but it was, uh, it was conceived before 9-11, believe it or not. I started working it on, in 2000, and it was called Emergency. And it was all about emergency equipment, everything that is designed just to work well and fast and be reliable, and therefore the beauty that really comes from this urgent function. So triage centers, ambulances, fire trucks, everything that I was, um, that populated New Yorkers' lives after 9-11. And it was so terrible uh, for me to think of that exhibition at the time the 9-11 happened that I just, you know, set it aside. I didn't want to do it anymore. And then in a few years, um, I went through the psychological uh, dynamics that so many New Yorkers and Americans went through. You go from the sense of shock to despair to wanting to be isolated to bouncing back. And the bounce back was interesting. It made me look at the other side of the medal. Emergency is reactive. Safety is proactive. And design is always about safety. It's about making people more comfortable, uh, to make things work better, and to make them safe. So this whole show was about design and safety, and it featured the UNHCR, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, TARPs, you know, the blue TARPs that, that are the baseline for any refugee camp. And then it also had Band-Aids for blisters. So it was this kind of amoral, non-denominational look at safety in all, uh, in all facets of society. The show that I did in 2008 that was called Design and the Elastic Mind was a big revelation also for me. It was an exhibition about design and science. Design and science is not, um, is not a synthesis that we see too often. Usually there's science, that's where innovation happens, then there's technology as a membrane and filter between the science and the world, and then there's design. But by collapsing design and science together and even having a series of salons where designers would talk to scientists, um, we discovered, and when I say we, I mean the designers, the scientists, and myself, that really there is a possibility for uh, direct communication. Because scientists, you know, it was also interesting because um, we worked um, with Adam Bly, who's the founder of Seed Media, who became a great friend and represented the scientific world. We discovered that we all both had both science and design chips on our shoulders. You know, designers are always considered lowly. They have no design critic at the New York Times, blah, blah, blah. You know, you've already heard my complaints, my cahier de doléances. And so they want to be lifted up. Scientists are tired to be considered lofty and detached from society and amoral once again, and they want to come down. So in this meeting point, we found so much possibility and the exhibition was a great success because for the public, it was an opening up of possibilities for the future. It featured nanoscience and nanodesign. It featured biological, biology and biodesign. There was a live um, coat, little coat in an incubator made of mouse stem cells that really provoked a big brouhaha because I had to basically kill it because it was growing too fast and I couldn't sleep at night. I mean, it was really this re interesting elevation of ideas that before hadn't really crossed our minds. So the importance of uh, design reflecting society is, I think, at the core of what we do at the Museum of Modern Art and certainly of what I'm passionate about. About. And that's where I would like to begin to discuss with you Talk to Me, which is a show that is opening actually in less than three weeks. And uh, people at MoMA are waiting for me to go back and install, and I'm very happy to be here and take a break. Talk to Me is an exhibition about, the com about communication, and that's why since the very beginning we had a journal, a blog online that showed the curatorial process. I mean, at this point we're almost at the last drops, but a year ago we were posting everything that we were looking at. Like, people would send us suggestions, we would put them there. People would see our cue, and then they would see how we categorize things. When things would fall off because they were not considered good enough for the show, of course, we wouldn't have a no section, because that's mean, but they would just disappear. 
And uh, therefore, we were able to kind of document the curatorial process. And that had uh, two main functions. One was to make the, proje the project transparent. People often ask us, how do you curate? You know, curating is such... Uh, a paradigm today for so many activities. I'm almost surprised, but that was a way to make it transparent. And also, it kept us on our toes, because by having this uh, website to go to, uh, knowing that we had to finish the queue by that certain day, it was, really, uh, it was really very helping also for the process for me and Kate Carmody, who's my curatorial assistant. And that's where we posted all of the ideas about the installation. So the whole exhibition is based on a very simple idea. Things talk with us. They talk to us. And they always have. It's not something new for centuries. I mean, if you go in literature, it's chock-a-full of objects from mud lens to other objects. You know, I have a, a beautiful poetry, a beautiful poem by a minor Italian, um, Italian poet that talks about the little things of really bad taste that were in his grandmother's home, and then he lists them all. And it's so lovely, you know, so... It's really, things have always spoken to us, and when I say things, I mean things at all scales, so objects and homes and places. Today, and however, because of the digital revolution, the communication is much more explicit, and we've come to expect it. We've, we've come to expect things to really have a conversation, and proof in the pudding is that when you put a child in front of a new object of any kind, she's going to look for buttons, she's going to look for switches, she's going to try and see if she can expand something. There's immediately an interface that is considered important. And so the exhibition really speaks about the fact that designers today you know, don't, cannot be anymore just form givers or function givers of, or meaning givers, all of the cliches of the 20th century about design rolled into one, they also have to be a little bit script writers. They have to think of writing the basic um, tenets of the conversation that will then be improvised. So I was very influenced by a few articles that Tina Fey, I haven't read her book yet, but that Tina Fey wrote, and I actually tried to invite her to be the main speaker for the symposium. She said that she can't come because she's, she's pregnant and she's very sweet. I mean, probably the, the truth is that it's ridiculous what MoMA can offer to such a speaker, but it's really, it was really lovely and it's a good idea. So now we'll try with Aaron Sorkin, second best. <laughs> If anybody knows how to get to Aaron Sorkin here, this is the right audience, please let me know. So uh, the exhibition spans through many different scales. And the first scale is, of course, the scale of objects. Objects speak with us at all different uh, levels. And this is a wonderful example. This is a little cardboard robot. It's a, it's a robot because it has an engine, but in truth, it's a little doll with wheels and engine and a little smile and eyes, and a flag, and it says, this is Sam, actually, because they all have names, this is Sam, and he says, please, help me cross Washington Square. So the designer puts little Sam at, the, at one corner of Washington Square, and then she's there with a camera hidden in her bag, and she watches what, thing, what happens. And you should see people going crazy helping this little thing cross Washington Square. Now, of course, we know that New Yorkers die for the possibility, the opportunity to help anybody or anything that needs directions. But still, you know, what she has documented is amazing. People redirect Sam and say, no, you can't go that way, there are too many cars. Or when he gets stuck, they lovingly pull him away. So it's a, it's a wonderful example of how people react to objects, and sometimes not even objects that have a little, a little eyes and a little mouth. Another example of an, the evolution of objects today, this is a dowsing rod. In the past centuries, it was used to look for water. Today, it's to look for Wi-Fi, <laughs> which is quite beautiful. Or um, this is a, a project coming from one of my favorite schools in the world, which is the Royal College of Art in London, and especially a program called Design Interactions. Design Interactions is about looking at, um, at objects and at technology with a critical eye, seeing what the possibilities are and what the dangers are, and looking for poetic uh, performances that objects can make to make us understand the future better. So this is uh, called the Attenborough Group. It's a fictional research group that is, of course, named after Sir Richard Attenborough, and it's about studying animal behaviors in objects. So it's a very uh, simple premise, but it's very effective when you see it in operation. For instance, you have a little computer that raises itself on its legs for self-preservation when you spill coffee on the desk. And you have a radio that has two nostrils and sneezes in order to set itself free from dust. Now, 
We tried before to make this video work, but there's a little bit of an issue with internet. So I, uh, I, I just exhort you to go and see it online because it's quite amazing. I don't know how many of you remember the culminating dialogue from American Beauty where Kevin Spacey and Annette Bening are at the table at the end and he's just quit his work. It's really like filled with anger. So this is a video that shows the objects on the table feeling the tension. It's just amazing. So objects reacting, this tension going back and forth and feeling it. Almost, you, you almost feel that they are children in an unhappy marriage with the, with the parents fighting all the time. And it's quite moving because once again, it's very close to animism, in a way, uh, this particular section of the show. I'm talking to you is the section that deals with bodies. It deals with uh, uh, people talking with people or with themselves by means of objects and by means of technology. And it's quite effective because it shows examples that are truly powerful. Now, those of you that are in the world of technology or in the world of design already probably know this project because it's an amazing project that garnered a lot of attention in the past two years. It's a group of designers, programmers, engineers, and hackers from New York and elsewhere. They're centered at iBeam, which is a center in, in New York City, but they're everywhere. And they all got together to help a graffiti artist from LA who has Lou Gehrig disease, and he's uh, is just bound to his bed in the hospital. They devised a way to enable this graffiti artist to tag buildings in downtown Los Angeles by using his pupils. So by using technology and by attaching a camera to his eyeglasses, the, um, the graffiti artist, Temp1, can actually coordinate, can actually command uh, a screen and tag on the screen uh, his signature. And then by wireless, uh, it's, con it's connected to a laptop in downtown LA where a laser tags the building. So it's an amazing way to remotely, using technology, uh, enable somebody to come back to his own life and to being an artist. And the funny thing is that we know that our brain is so plastic that even though it seems that there are so many steps removed, we fill them in. The feeling is the same. The feeling is that of being actively there, tagging the building. This is called the iWriter Project, and it's really a testament to the power of technology when it's used well. Very uh, more, much more tongue-in-cheek, but still feasible and real, is this project called eChromai. I was telling you about how many art, um, designers collaborate with scientists, and once again, the RCA in London was pioneering this particular coming together of different minds. And this is the project of Daisy Ginsburg and James King that, um, together with uh, a team from the Cambridge University in, uh, in the UK, participated in this synthetic biology jamboree that happens every year at the MIT. Synthetic biology, because it's about building new organisms block by block by using DNA units and putting them together, has proved very much in connection with design. And this project was one of the first full-fledged collaborations. The idea is very simple. You take E. coli. We all know that these bacteria live in our intestines and in our gastrointestinal system. And you tweak them by... Uh, by having a drink that is almost like a milkshake of enzymes so that they react and produce different colors depending on some pathological conditions that you might have. So your output becomes the diagnostic tool. So there's also like a whole, uh, sked, uh, a whole uh, uh, diagram that shows all the different colors corresponding to different pathologies you might have, you know, just like very simply irritated bowel syndrome, or you might have instead some, some more serious pathologies that actually can be detected from your stool. So it's interesting because even though, of course, it's not possible yet, it's very feasible. And that's where designers differ very often from other forms of creative output. They're always about feasibility. There's always something practical and feasible about what they envision. This is a completely different uh, project, but still it's about communication, interpersonal communication. It's the work of Adi Maron, and they are platform, extensible platforms that are commanded by an iPhone app that enable you to get taller if you need to and speak to a tall person eye to eye or even to reach uh, high in the cereal aisle. And this is 
quite a beautiful game. You know, of course, social networks are extremely important in our world today, but they have been quite resistant to good design. And this is still MoMA, so I have to show good design examples. So I'm not going to have naked examples of Twitter or Facebook, etc., but I'm still going to address social networks by looking at different games and applications that are made for them. This is quite a beautiful game that basically transforms you into a little squid that looks for other squids to team up and eat other squids. Now, you might think, how silly. Well, it's very engaging because the image that is projected large on the screen, you all play in front of the screen, is beautiful. It's almost like watching a black and white lava lamp. So it's interesting because uh, technology can sometimes be completely uh, superfluous, but nonetheless give you a sense of belonging and transform and visualize your position in life in different ways. Life. Life speaks to us in many different ways, and designers have been tackling it for many years. This is one of the most straightforward ways to actually have a sense of life and visualize it. It's Nicholas Felton, who's a designer in New York, who every year puts out an annual report of, him, of himself. So he calls it Feltron Report. He adds an R because it sounds much more corporate. And he takes everything he's done, where he's eaten, where he's gone, whom he's spoken to, how many times he's had sex and when, and then puts them all in diagrams, the kind of diagrams that we usually see when we look at scientific phenomena or, or sociopolitical data. And it's really quite powerful. And every year he does it with a different graphic um, attitude. And last year, actually, he devoted his annual report to his father because he had passed away. So he visualized his father's life in these beautiful diagrams. Visualization design is a very important um, part of our current design scene, and it's going to become even more so because the more data are available, the more we need to make sense of them. And it's not only us. It's also scientists and politicians. They need to have a way to visualize things in clear, engaging uh, solutions. So life talks to us, and one of the representations in the exhibition that's one of my favorite is this video game by Jason Rohrer. It's a video game that people will be able to play. It lasts five minutes, and in five minutes you go through life. You know, you are born, and then you go through life, and then you die. And there's the little tombstone, maybe you can see it at the top right. And, you know, you make choices, just like every video game. You can choose to have a partner of not or not. If you decide to have a partner, life is longer but more complicated. So, you know, you have more, more obstacles, but, you know, you live longer. If you don't have a partner, you have it easier, it's more fun, but you die earlier, and <laughs> you die sooner, and there's no second life. You know, it's not like other video games where you can have another life. No, that's it. So it's quite philosophical, you know, five minutes of, uh, of perspective, one could say. It's not only people's lives, it's also other objects' lives, and this is one of the most beautiful and poetic examples of uh, some things after life that came out in the past few years. It's a beautiful book that depicts the afterlife of a pig, a pig chosen at random in a farm in the Netherlands. Uh, in fact, it's called Pig 05049. It just has a number. And the designer followed every single cell of the pig. I mean, of course, not literally, but of course, she tracked it down to see which products it would be used in. And she tracked down about 180 ranging from, of course, you know, meats, et cetera, and pork, et cetera, but also ceramic glaze, uh, cigarettes, the hemoglobin of pigs is used in the filter. I mean, you name it. So you have this beautifully laid out and beautifully made uh, compendium of the afterlife of the pig and also of our current society. I mean, you realize that it's almost impossible to truly be kosher because pigs are everywhere. So it's, it's very interesting because it's, once again, a perspective that we've never seen before. More poetic and still quite beautiful is uh, the idea that life is also about our genetic tracing and finding out where we come from, you know, trying to understand our possible pathologies for the future. And Revital Cohen, who's a, a designer in London, uh, devised this whole system whereby her ancestors, of course it's fictional, tell her about her genetic code and about the possible genetic inherited diseases that she might have. So it's much more poetic. There's this disclosure case in which she listens to the voices of her family telling her everything instead of seeing it tabulated in a cold and scientific manner. 
when we talk about life and we try to talk to life, sometimes we also try to talk to God, and the exhibition addresses several different gods also. This is a beautiful device that is used by some cloistered nuns in the north of England. It was designed by some designers in London. And, you know, they're cloistered, so they don't get the news. They only get some Vatican newspapers, and I can tell you as an Italian they're not reliable. So she has this little device that is almost like a ticker tape that is attached to Google News on one hand and then to a website called We Feel Fine on the other hand. We Feel Fine is a website that looks for iterations of the, of the root feel on the Internet. So it gets back all of these very intimate thoughts by people around the world and then addresses them in various ways. So you have the macro level from Google News and the micro level from We, we Feel Fine, and it's in the corridor of the monastery, and so the nuns go by and look, and they say, oh, my God, little Ingrid in, uh, uh, in Hamburg is, is feeling down today because the weather is so bad, or there's a problem in Afghanistan. I know that it might seem weird, but they have something to pray about. <laughs> they use it for real all the time. And we also address the Muslim religion, and uh, we found a designer, a Turkish designer, who designed this prayer mat that has embedded LEDs and a compass, and it lights up when you're in the exact direction of Mecca. I mean, it's almost like redundant, because of course, if you're a Muslim, you know where Mecca is. But it's one more attempt to connect technology of today with, with rituals of centuries ago. The city speaks, speaks to us, and we definitely speak back to the city. And... Once again, designers try to work at all levels. So you see here a project called Baker Tweet. Baker Tweet is a very simple device. It sits in a bakery in London, in East London, and the bakers, you, know, it's, you see it's very sturdy because it's, uh, you know, bakers maybe have dough on their hands and flour. So on the website, they set the different options, and let's say when the croissants are coming out of the oven, they send a tweet to their su subscribers who can flock to the bakery and get their croissants hot. It's really funny, but uh, this reminds me of, you know, Adolescents, when we were going to clubs all night, and then we would sniff around the city of Milan to try and find out where the bread was coming from. Really, we were using our nose. In this case, you get a tweet, so it's much more, it's much more comfortable. And then the scale instead, you go from the scale of the neighborhood to the scale of the building. This is a building in Tokyo that uses the technology of QR tags to send you to a, a website that gives you more information about what's going on in the building. It's quite interesting because QR tags are being used more and more. Are you all familiar with the technology? Well, very quickly, you see those dots, those pixels. Together, they form a code that can be read by a smartphone with a, with a particular program, and that sends you to a website. So the pixels that you see here are... Uh, a code uh, for a URL, for an, a website address. And then on the website, you can have all sorts of information. And you, you will see them more and more. They're quite used in advertising these days. So you see many magazines sometimes in the ads have this QR tag that sends you to more information about that particular advertiser. Of course, the city, you know, we're talking about high technology, but sometimes the city talks to us in very, very low technology, for instance, with smell. This is the work of Cecil Tolas. Cecil Tolas is an artist that lives in Germany. Actually, she's an artist, a scientist, and a designer, and she uses headspace technology. Headspace technology was developed in the 1960s by the perfume industry to capture the scent of living objects without killing them. It's interesting. So it's almost like a cupping technology that you would see in old acupuncturist uh, labs to capture the scent of a gardenia without destroying the gardenia. It's very delicate and very effective because it's then sent, you know, the, the aroma is sent to a spectrometer that kind of replicates the, the, the scent. Well, she used this technology for Berlin. So here you have a map of Berlin by scent, and the smells in the different area, the, the great perfume of Mitte and the aroma of Kreuzberg that are in a bottle, and it's going to be sitting on the map of Berlin. And then we go to the macro scale. And at the macro scale of the city, there are, there are so many different maps and visualizations that are possible. This is one of the most well-known. It's called Locals and Tourists, and it kind of tracks the places, the locations. You're looking here at New York, and I think the other one is London. Yeah, it must be London, yes. And London. Um, and you see in red are marked the areas where the tourists take more pictures, and in blue where the locals do. So you already have a sense as a newcomer of where you want to go or not want to go to avoid tourists or not. And the, the way it does so is by 
taking pictures from Picasa and from Flickr, there are two picture um, services on the web, and by tracking the time, how many times over what period the pictures are taken, it kind of de 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 okay, it makes a deduction, <laughs> sorry, it makes a deduction whether it's a tourist or a local. And I wanted to um, talk about this project that is from a long time ago, and it's from my, my friend Kevin Slavin and others at Area Code. It's one of the projects that I love the most. It's not really going to be in the show because it's not easy to replicate. I mean, you can imagine how difficult it is sometimes to replicate these objects in the show uh, because they have life outside in the real world, because they are interactive. And this is not, uh, not possible, so it's only in the catalog. But it really gives you an idea of where design lives today. These are... Um, this is a game that sits on your cell phone, but also sits in real life. So you see on that cell phone, on that screen, you see a replica of the streets of the West Village where those two people are finding themselves. And it's almost like a Pac-Man game. You are the two Pac-Mans, and then there's a Papa Samdi, this monster that is represented by a skull that wants to eat you. The skull exists only on the screen, and still... In real life, in the West Village, you're running for your life because you're scared to death because this virtual creature that does not exist wants to eat you on the cell phone screen. I was telling you about how we complement and how we connect, you know, how Tempt One, the graffiti artist, was feeling as if he were tagging the building life. Similarly, sometimes we live on our screen, but we feel like it's the true world, and we bridge the two together. And this coming together of the virtual and of the real world is where so much of our future will reside, not only as designers, but also as people. And worlds talk to us in many different ways. You know, um, this particular section of the exhibition talks about how to enable children to see the world as an ant. You know, you see that red helmet and the red gloves. The red gloves have a camera that sends an image to the helmet that lets you magnify whatever you see at least ten times. And instead, the yellow one is to make you feel what it means to be a giraffe. So you, you almost have like a periscope that makes you higher. So device to simulate and give perspective. And this is another device to simulate and give perspective in a completely different way. It's called BBC Dimensions, and I really love this project. It lets you go to a website, punch in your postal code, and then it lets you take phenomena that happened elsewhere from, you know, the, the, the golf spill, the, the oil spill in the Gulf, or the moonwalk of the Apollo 11, and superimpose them onto your neighborhood. So you have a sense in, on your skin on your own experience, you have a sense of the magnitude and you realize that the Apollo 11 moonwalk was a walk around the corner. You know, sometimes it's a little bit of a downfall, but still, it's interesting because it gives you perspective on, uh, on what happens elsewhere. Josh Ahn designed in 2004 this website that to me was one of the first examples of a real political use of the internet and of visualization. It was a website that connected um, different corporate boards in the United States with different uh, parts of the government. And therefore, it showed connections, possible conflicts of interest, relationships that were once not really visible because there was no way to link them visually. Once again, visualization is one of the most powerful tools we have for all of our purposes, to get to the truth or to cover the truth, to understand in a deeper way or to obfuscate what is in front of us. We, we deal with visualization design every single day. Every day you look at diagrams, you look at visualizations on magazines and on newspapers, and they are very powerful in the way they position issues and in the way they make them more relevant to society. And this is a very poetic, uh, poetic gesture. I was telling you before about QR tags. So you see here a gigantic QR tag that is mown into a lawn in Thuringia in Germany. Now, it's a way not only to talk about contemporary technology, but also to connect it with some of the most ancient traditions of, you know, land art, you know, uh, Aztec uh, land art or other forms of art that in theory would be visible only by the gods and now instead could be visible by satellites. And in fact, this particular tag, which spells the, world, the words hello world, um, is visible from satellites. Hello world is the first basic computing program that any, new, any engineer uses when testing a new program. So it has a lot of resonance, even though it already speaks by itself, it has also a lot of resonance for engineers. 
And I was telling you before about giving perspective and, uh, uh, and understanding what happens elsewhere. This is a very interesting project. It's about taking the solar system and putting it proportion, in proportion onto a neighborhood in London. So basically, this, this student started with the sun and then tracked the distance from the sun or the various planets onto a neighborhood in London in proportion, and then she found shopkeepers at the various stops where the planets should be that would be in charge of the planet. So for this performance, for about three days, you would get into the shops and this shopkeeper would tell you about Venus, give you all sorts of uh, data about Venus and, and explain to you the whole science behind it. So it was quite beautiful also, a way to engage and narrate a phenomena in a different way. The last section of the show, which is also maybe my favorite, is double entendre. Whenever there's a communication and a dialogue going on, there can be double entendre. Double entendre can be conversation stoppers, or they can be very powerful ways to get the conversation in another direction. And from this viewpoint, we, are, we have tried to feature in the show a few projects that are really at that edge and that are full of potential. For instance, uh, the work of Sputniko. Sputniko is one of my favorite artists of today, and I'm showing you here one of her more um, subdued projects. There's another one in the show that I'm going to describe without showing, which is a menstruation machine, which is a, a device that looks like a chastity belt that enables men, children, transgender men, or menopausal women to experience a menstruation. So it's a, such a powerful... And I don't show... I don't, you know, I'm almost afraid of showing the image because I've, I've had so much reaction about it. But, but it's really great, and I find it very poetic because it's the ultimate gesture of trying to understand the other. And to me, really, that's what the ultimate goal is for designers and for us, to put ourselves in uh, the shoes and in other things of other people. But this is another project by Sputniko in which uh, she represents a girl, Jenny, that uh, is so uncomfortable with people that she really prefers to speak with crows. So she devised this robot that imitates five different uh, calls that the crows make and enables her to talk with them. Similarly, in a, another project is about explaining to New Yorkers what bats are doing. So there's a big billboard that functions as housing for bats and also explains the importance of bats for the ecosystem. You, you know, everybody, every single designer and artist takes a little bit of reality and does his or her own little work. And all together, they become really a gathering of possibilities. Another example of double entendre is a Rubik's Cube for the blind, where instead of colors, you have the name of the color spelt in on the, different, uh, on the different squares of the cube. And last but not least is this quite beautiful project that visualizes hyperlinks in a book by using real red threads. So it shows the interconnectedness of so much that we do today virtually in a physical way. So what I'm hoping from the show is that it will give a new platform for designers to feel validated and to go on doing what they're doing so well, to position what they do in front of the public so that the public also will be more sensitive and more critical. Because ultimately, I believe that it's not just a matter of design literacy. You know, we talk about design thinking, about design literacy, about design understanding. There's so many different levels in which we try to make design and our passion percolate down to real life. The truth is, it's a responsibility. Design is for us. It's for all of us. So we need to be critical. We need to be able to say what goes and what does not go. And we need to be able to tweak, especially today when feedback is so available and companies really listen to it. We need to be able to shoot back and say what does not work. We need to be able to do it with companies. We need to be able to do it with cities and with government. And this ex exhibition, I hope, will give people a sense of belonging and a sense of possibilities and a sense of criticism. Thank you very much, and I would love to take questions if you have them. Thank you. I don't know how much time I have left. Can somebody in the back? Oh, I can read it. Oh, 20? Yes, thank you. So we have 20 minutes for questions and for conversation, if you feel like it. Anybody? There's one over there. Thank you. Do you see a distinction between design and art? And if so, what is it? It's very difficult to make a distinction that is based on the object itself. I would say it's impossible. So what I tend to do when, when I get asked this question is I revert to the idea of intention, but it's even more subtle. And I will use 
something that I used when I was teaching at UCLA many years ago. I was teaching a course that was open to the whole campus that was called The Nature of Design. And it was fun because I had geologists and political science people, I mean, all sorts of people, and this question would come up. And I used to say, the difference is very simple. Um, an artist can choose whether to work and be responsible towards other people or not. A designer has to be by definition. It's almost as if a designer took a, a Hippocratic oath. Also, you know, designers love this Hippocratic oath because they like this kind of constrained freedom and a few directions. They're better at that. But the truth is that all that, you sh that I've shown you here could be design or art. It wouldn't really matter if it were not for the fact that it was positioned and desi as design and it came to the world as design. This one there. Oh, you, but you can do there and then we'll get to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. This is really interesting and Thank your you. comments on uh, perspective really uh, came alive when you were showing uh, things like the golf spill in your neighborhood and uh, for educational purposes, it would seem like design has a huge uh, field of opportunity in order to, uh, for example, show people uh, when you read a headline about a bombing in Iraq or a bombing in Afghanistan, how 99 and 9 tenths percent of the country is still at some level of peace. Uh, your comments about the solar system and uh, the, how that all fits together to be able to show uh, visually to children in school uh, instead of trying to show them on a piece of paper, uh, but to have some kind of a model or I don't know if I know what I'm talking about. No, no, and, uh, and, it, and it happens very often. I mean, also here we've had, there was a great panel yesterday morning about education where a few of our heroes of contemporary education were speaking. And they're the ones that use not only these kind of stratagems, but even games to teach children. So the possibilities of connection and perspective um, are quite endless. And just the fact that you can be reading something and going directly online and looking at where it is. I mean, I remember when every time I would ask what a word meant, my father said, go get the dictionary, and I would have to go to the other room and get the big, you know. Now it's not like that anymore because I can do it right there. So the possibilities are enormous, and there are people that are working exactly in that direction. Yes? Thank you for a very interesting presentation. Thank just you. a quick comment. Living only three blocks from MoMA, my wife and I are looking forward to the opening of, of the show. We'll be right there. Um, I just almost want to follow up the first question with the definitions and understanding the, the nature of design. A young friend of, a friend of mine who in his younger days attended the RCA uh, design program came out and told me when I visited him there in London that they taught that design is the third branch of knowledge combining the artistic and the scientific, that the designers have to synthesize those two in order to be successful in their work. And I wonder if you could react to that. You know, definitions, it's whatever works for people. Um, I have a particular um, problem with differentiating design and art or creating a hierarchy. Uh, but I don't think your friend was doing this. And I think that a scientist would also jump up and say, hey, why do you put me to the other side, right? So I see, I, I'm, I'm uncomfortable with definitions that are so clear cut, just me, you know? That's why I revert to the intentions. But there are so many possible definitions, and this is certainly one that is very explanatory and can be the beginning of a conversation, but it needs to go deeper then. That's how I feel. <laughs> Thank you. Over there. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Paula. Uh, Thank you, I really love your work, and welcome down from Boston to New York to see the opening. Um, my question relates to, uh, to John Maida's talk yesterday about leadership and design. And if you had a few suggestions or thoughts on what we could do as a society and um, in higher education to make sure that tomorrow's leaders, the business and political leaders, as well as you know, the industrialists, have um, a, a thorough grasp of design and can work that into the organizations that they run and the services and products that they make. Because I feel there's a, um, a disconnect where we, we 
uh, train leaders to speak better and raise more money and, and, and have all, all those critical skills, but not really understand design and elevate designers to the right level in their organizations? Well, uh, there's a little bit of a problem. You know, there's a sort of strange protectionism. Um, coming from Europe, I always felt that having feet and inches and pounds here was a form of protectionism because it's such an instinctive way. I cannot reason in inches, you know, so I feel that I'm really cut out. Um, and I think that there's a similar basic instinctual barrier between, with some exceptions, of course, between people that go to most business schools or political science schools and design. Now, of course, there are many, many exceptions, and you know you've heard many times, the MFA is the new MBA, blah, blah. Okay, we'll see if it really works. But so far, I feel that there have been people that have attempted to break the ice. We have here the people from IDEO that have uh, worked on this discipline of design thinking. Um, the problem is this. Design thinking is to design what the scientific method is to science. It's not the real thing. It's a distillation of the process, and it's very helpful to get you going and to make you to help you find new ways to approach the issues at hand. But it's not the real design uh, way to, and it's not really the approach that designers use when they tackle a real design project. So I think that we're talking a lot about science um, literacy and about the importance of science in schools. Design is maybe not as fundamental as science. I don't want to be as arrogant, but it's truly important because it's about making. It's about being accountable. It's about being responsible. It's about the fact that what you do will have consequences also for other people. Excuse me, isn't that the basics, the basic tenet of democracy? So when you think about it this way, design should be taught even in K-12. to You know, it should be taught everywhere. It's about responsibility, making things stand up. You might have a great idea, but can it stand up on its feet? Can you do a chair with two legs? No, you can't. You know, so it's so important and so basic and so fundamental that I think it should be taught even more so, that even, even in, in more empirical terms. Now, John is here, so I don't know if you want to add, I don't want to put you on the spot, but really the STEM to STEAM, uh, yeah, I just want to point, you don't have to talk, but I wanted to point you out. The STEM to STEAM idea, you know, he, um, John bundles design and art, and rightly so because of his position and also because it's, tr it's right to do it. The idea of doing a policy of STEM to STEAM education is really powerful, and I think we should push for it a lot uh, for the future of society. There's one here, and then I'll go to the lady here. Oh, the microphone is coming. Oh, thank, no. you. thank you, Paula. It's just fantastic. Thank you. Fantastic, and Congratulations. Uh, I would like to ask you a somewhat personal question. How do you explain that uh, Italians, for instance, are notoriously fantastic in design, in every design, in the automobiles? In the, no, but really think about it. I mean, how many, I don't want to point out some other countries, but they might be wonderful in other things, but the Italians are, you know, just inherently were always fantastic in designs. Why is it you have a different... I don't know. Uh, I don't, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, what I think you know, you think about anything, whether it's Ungaro or, or Fiat or Maserati. Well, I don't know. Well, Fiat, please. I mean, <laughs> it will look good, but it doesn't work. It's, still, it's always like that. I don't know. Maybe because we don't have anything better to do on the political level. And I was talking to a friend yesterday. We're totally irrelevant. We, you know, we're, we've been horrible even at having colonies. I mean, really, they laugh at us. Our, our colonies, like, look at us lovingly because we were so ridiculous, you know. So it's really, maybe that's what it is. Maybe that's where we decided to focus. I just wish that the political uh, body helped this kind of creativity. Instead, it doesn't do anything. If anything, it quashes it because it's such a gerontocracy and it's so impossibly paralyzed. But it's... Um, it's really, I wouldn't be able to, to express it. There are so many cliches about it. It might even come from the fact that we're a very young country. People think that we've existed forever, but Italy has existed only since 1861, and we were squashed together. We didn't really want to be together. So even this kind of friction maybe is interesting. You know? So I don't know. I mean, 
I'm glad, but I also know that different countries have different strengths. Like, we're very strong in design, but art uh, education stops at Dada. So when I moved to New York, I was like, what? And I had my friend Lita's three-year-old that wanted to take me, you know, took me by the hand and took me to Soho to see Julian Schnabel's Dark Totems. And, you know, so when you see that ease with contemporary art, or when you go to Latin America and you see that the default style for any kind of new, you know, one-family home is a great modernism. You know, so it's funny. Um, we all have different strengths. And the lady there, the lady there with the... the yeah, yeah. And then I'll come, then I'll come to Fred. Um, except for your size and your history, how does the philosophy of MoMA differ from the Museum of Art and Design? Well, it's very different because, uh, well, the Museum of Art and Design made a choice a few years ago um, that I told them also I don't think was really the right choice. Well, maybe it was. I don't know. But they're doing a fantastic job right now. But it was called the Museum of Crafts or the Crafts Museum, right? So MoMA has, um, has a beginning in the industrial arts. So until a few years ago, we would not acquire prototypes. And we would have... Not that much decorative arts. I mean, we would have some decorative arts, but always the one that contributed, that went into the vein of then becoming industrial. So it in it's interesting. There was always this concept, this Bauhaus concept and this modernist concept of um, design being the opportunity that everybody, even people without too much money, had to have art in their lives. So there was really an attention to the product. For instance, the Volkswagen Beetle, okay, we're MoMA, so... We have been offered the original Beetle with the split windshield before Second World War, the one that's really precious, but we decided to acquire the 1959 one. Why? Because that was the car of the 60s. That was really the people's car that transformed so much the way people thought about cars and about the world. So MoMA has always been in this direction, and instead the Crafts Museum has always been about, in, in the past, about documenting crafts. Now the funny thing is that crafts today is fundamental for design because the more we, we have advanced technology, the more there are no machines to apply it yet, so you need your hands, and it's very crafty. I mean, everything that we consider important and innovative is very crafty. So, uh, so the two missions are very different, but in the end they all come together with the usual uh, mission that is educational that museums in New York and in the States have, which is to me, was to me one of the most beautiful discoveries when I came here. Fred? Mm -hmm. I, I love what you do. I think, and Thank it you. opened uh, my eyes more than anything I've seen in a long time. Well, we've, seen, we've known each other for a long oh, time. It's not fair. <laughs> but no, what you did to me, did for me, was something I'm really grateful for. Um, you know, I studied with a man, or I worked with a man, William White, who did a whole book called The Social Life of Small so Urban great. Spaces, which is great. just amazing stuff. And he did also a book called The City, which is fundamental. Yeah, right, yeah. and so it's fundamental. But what we've we've started this thing called placemaking. You know, how do you create a place? Well, we get into these enormous arguments with the, some of the design profession who want to impose their form or shape on a place. And what you were showing were all these little ways that design could help to enhance a place or to make a place come alive. And that's so wonderful because we get these silo disciplines that think they have the answer. And what you're saying is let all kinds of things happen in these places so that they become the life of that place. Well, there are some offices, some design offices. There's much more in the show. But, um, for instance, there's a design company called Future Farmers in San Francisco. What they do is they're really engaged in design. So they built a website that lets local growers of vegetables connect with each other. So if somebody has extra tomatoes. I mean, it's like a, it's like a registry of local vegetable growers in San Francisco, for instance. Or there's another company in London called Participle that works with... Uh, say, elderly people that have lost their partner and therefore have no more social life and they don't want to leave the home. And they go there and teach them to use Skype and to use the web so that they can recreate a social circle and then take the courage to even go out and meet other people. So there are so many placemakers or place enablers amongst the young design companies that it's, um, it's something that warms the heart. It's quite beautiful. Wait, oh, oh, oh. Uh, I'm going to go John and then the lady. John. Mm -hmm. 
I was taking notes after Hugo's question. <laughs> um, uh, I think the answer is in our friend Adam Bly, who talks about it isn't about how do you elevate something, it's how you reveal the importance of something. How do you, how you what? How, how you, you reveal the importance. Reveal, yes. And true. I think that when you see you know, your work and how you curate and take, take, you take the best vegetables from around the world <laughs> and you make them visible t for all of us. And uh, it's basically a case study method, yeah. but it's so. couched differently. Uh, secondly, the context of everything Paolo is able to bring to us as the best green grocer in the world of ideas um, is that um, it's somehow in a different part. It's in, not in the main space yet of the world, but I think that this kind of group can make that happen. So how do we make that happen? How do these kind of things make it to the main stage of, of the world? I don't even know. I mean, it's, it's a little bit of a, maybe a long tail cliche, but I don't even know if there's a need for a main stage anymore. So that's why I might complain about the New York Times not having a design critic, but frankly, so what? You know what I'm saying? It's like I have you, and I have Fred, and I have Hugo. I mean, so um, the main stage is available all the time for those who look for it. Of course, there's the so-called, what's well, called the global elite, the people that are here, that go to Davos, that, you know, that are, meet each other and... You know, I'm always so intimidated. The people that intimidate me, they're the global elite. And uh, that's maybe the center stage, but they should, they are the ones that should really go off the main stage because otherwise they're going to become isolated. So, you know, that's how I believe you make it happen, by making those designers feel validated by a show up MoMA. You know, it's like I'm very lucky to work there because I can... So you, know, so you make them feel validated, you give them confidence, maybe they can find some money by leveraging the catalog and the website, and off they go. Thank you. Lady here, and then you and then. Yeah. You touched briefly on one person in there who had ALS, with, uh, able to communicate more. The world in medical science and the design of many of the, the um, prostheses um, the instrumentation, uh, that's a whole opening. Oh, yeah. It's a fabulous area, and I don't know that people know, you know, the beauty of how these, peop these physicians, and many of them are engineers, actually, um, who have designed something to make a part, you know, that will make, your, you know, whether it's your hip, um, your knee, but the functionality of, and the beauty of the design of these mechanisms to make life better for those people. Oh, it's fantastic. And, I agree uh, with you. I was wondering if you ever thought about exploring that as, as yeah. you know, as Actually, an exhibit. The, when, when SAFE was called emergency, there was a lot of that. And in Design and the Elastic Mining, the one about science, we had the new prosthesis of ankle by Hugh Herr at the MIT. It's a fantastic area. And we have a pacemaker in the MoMA collection. We have never tackled it head on, and maybe we should, but it definitely is always in our minds, I agree. Can I take one last one? Yeah, um, one last one, and then you can go. Mm -hmm. I just came back from Basel and um, went and visited Vitra House. Oh, beautiful. I was so impressed with mm -hmm. what they've done. This is, of course, much more abstract and more uh, cutting edge, but I was very impressed with their ability to really incorporate, I mean, everyday life and chairs and all that in such a high design level. Have you seen that? No, I haven't been there in, in person yet, but I've seen it in pictures. Mm -mm, I'll go soon. All right. Well, I want to thank the audiovisuals crew very much. AV crew, thank you. And thank you very much for coming. See you later. Thank you.